Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word. Book of Exodus, uh, that that brings freedom to our people, is a type of us entering the promised land here in the end times. God wanted uh, to the children after 400 years to be released, and uh, 10 times he had to bring wrath upon the children of Egypt for one purpose, as it was written back in the seventh chapter in the fifth verse, so they would know that God was God, not some frog, not, not somebody's imagination, not a stick, but that Yahweh, our Heavenly Father, was God, so they themselves could worship him rather than some frog god or something else. And therefore, he hung tough. And finally, after having taken the firstborn of Egypt, both in cattle and people, Pharaoh then called Moses and Aaron and said, go away, take your people, be gone. Because the people said, we're dead people, get them out of here. They wanted the children released. So they, uh, with unleavened bread and their kneading troughs and borrowing much gold and silver, which they had earned over a 400 year period, then they depart. And that's where we pick it up at in Chapter 12, verse 37, as they begin to their journey to the promised land. There are many lessons in it that apply even to this day. Pay close attention. And verse 37, and it reads, And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses, that's the city of the sun in Egypt, to Sukkot, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. That's quite a number of people. Shukut means booths, where they would take lean-tos and booths, and this is where they would, would camp that first time. Verse 38, And a mixed, who was with them? A mixed multitude went up also with them in flocks and herds, even very much cattle. These were no doubt Egyptians that did convert and are intermarried and so forth. Verse 39. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough, which they brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry. There wasn't time for yeast to raise in the dough, they had to cook it without the, the dough having risen. Neither had they prepared for themselves any vittles. Uh, and so it was. It was a rush to be released when Pharaoh was through with them. They hauled. Verse 40. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dealt in Egypt were 430 years. Now this confuses many people because it's 430 years from the time Abraham in the 15th chapter of the great book of Genesis was told that this would happen, but that they would leave even much richer than they came. Verse 41, it was only a 400 year captivity though. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years after the promise to Abraham, even the selfsame day it came to pass that all the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Every soul, the host is the multitude, okay? the children of Israel and those that were with them mingled. 42, it is the night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. And you must always remember this night of the Lord. For not only is there the day of the Lord, which is the millennium, 
but we have also this night of the Lord. I'm going to go with you to Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 20. You're not going to have it. I'm going to read it to you. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Thus spake, thus saith the Lord, If you can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, and he should not have a son to reign upon his throne, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. And naturally it would be Christ that would reign upon that throne. And you must remember, though, there is a night. Why? Because we have the prince of darkness. It means the Antichrist is coming before the true Christ does. But God is still the God of that night. Because he has his election that he directs, that he guides, that he interjects by the Holy Spirit the very words of God in that end generation, in that night of darkness, when the false Messiah is here, the prince of darkness in his time, God's still in control. This is an important thing that you should always remember. So many people... Allow yourselves to get shook up a little bit. If you ever kind of feel a little alone, you're not alone. God is with you. If you're one of God's elect, if you have the knowledge of truth, then you have that comforter always with you. You have nothing to worry about. So, and so it is. Uh, so we were to observe this um, throughout all generations. And all generations means even to this time. Well, what, what, what day is that? The 15th of, of Abib. The 15th Abib is a, a green ears. And is it, you know, it is ironic that the Cherokee Nation, which their headquarters is not very far from where this broadcast is made, every spring they have green ears also that they celebrate. How, how is that? How does that come to pass? Well, it's like... And how do, do they call God Yahweh and um, with the Holy Spirit? Many, many things that have, through the migrations of people, would leave a mystery to those that document those truths uh, and how precious it is. But that 15th day of Abib would always, always be that Passover and Christ himself became our Passover, that lamb that was crucified on that cross, shed his blood, that that blood which we are under, it is that blood that is on our doorpost of, of our mind, heart, body, and soul that causes in the night of the Lord for that death angel to still pass over anything we possess and giving us the power and the authority to utilize that authority that God has given us in the name of Jesus Christ. So this is not just a passing thing. This is to go on through generation to generation. Verse 43 to continue. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. I don't want, naturally, our Passover today is the table of the Lord. It is the bread, which is the body of Christ, his body that took the stripes and that we get the healing. And the wine, which is symbolic of his blood that was shed. Do not let a non-believer partake of that table. And why would a non-believer wish to anyway? They have no business taking it. Verse 44, But every manservant that is bought for, bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. Now, what is the circumcision of today? It has nothing to do with male or female. It has to do with circumcision of the heart, loving the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you love him, and your heart and mind are circumcised within him, it's a spiritual thing, because you're under the blood of that cross 
the word Passover takes on a new meaning. And when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, when Christ became our Passover, it's such a beautiful thing that when you believe, then that that is negative, that you can't handle, must pass over your home, must pass over you. This wasn't just a one-time affair. It happens generation through generation, even to this day. So you want to always utilize that authority that God has given you concerning Passover. Verse 45, a foreigner and an hired servant shall not eat thereof. If you're not a believer, forget it. Verse 46, if one house, this is the same house, shall it be eaten, thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall you break a bone thereof. And this comes brings forth the law even that Christ could not have a bone broken when he was to pronounce dead on the cross, that they pierced his side rather, for they knew that he was dead. And there wasn't one bone broken where this prophecy could be carried out even to the Lamb of God who became our Passover. Did that because he loves you. Verse 47, all the congregation of Israel shall keep it, even to this day. 48, and when a stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord. Let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as one that uh, is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. And of course, uh, I must say that uh, circumcision today is not a thing of hygiene. Uh, that, or rather, that's really what it is for if a person so chooses that. But it has nothing to do with Passover or following the Lord. You have circumcision of the heart, which is to say you believe and love the Lord Jesus Christ and know that he was able to pay this price on the cross. And it goes for both male and female to love him, appreciate him, and know that because he became our Passover, as it's written in Luke chapter 10, verses 18 and 19, he gave us power over all of our enemies. But you have to, you have, to have the power and the authority to use it. And you use it in Christ's name. That's what sets true Christians apart from non-Christians. You have that authority, that power. And God backs you up every foot of the way. Why? Because Christ became our Passover. Verse 49. One law shall be to him that is homeborn and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. 50. Thus did all the children of Israel, as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. They, they, they followed instructions. 51, and it came to pass the selfsame day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. That is to say, the whole host. God always keeps his word. God has made the declaration, as it's written in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21, that he's, he's going to deliver us even when the false Messiah is here on earth. He's going to be with us. We have nothing to worry about and nothing to fear. For we, as it is written in Luke 21, they can't harm a hair on your head. Why? Because really you have authority over them. But you must be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. That's part of the family. That's being in the family of God and allowing our Heavenly Father to participate right here on earth against the false one when he comes to deceive your own families that are 
uninformed. Chapter 13, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, To sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. Now here he had destroyed the firstborn of all the Egyptians and those that sojourned among them. And now he himself claims the firstborn for his service. Verse 3, And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall no leaven bread be eaten. Leaven is symbolic of, of, of uh, sin. And you're going to keep that sin out of your family, out of your house. And that's what the leavened bread stands for. Unleavened sin gone. And here they came out of slavery, brutal slavery. And they were freed in that day. God always keeps his promise. Verse 4, This day came you out in the month Abib. That's green ears again. And um, meaning green ears because it's that time of the year. Okay. Verse 5, And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Havites, and the Jebusites, which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. This is why that 14 days after the spring equinox, at sundown, becomes on the solar calendar the 15th of Abed, the green ears. You want to always remember that. That is that day. That is the day that Christ freed us uh, through the Father, that is to say, and brought the people out of bondage, severe bondage. You know, a, a lot of you allow yourself today to be caught up in the bondage of this world worry and wonder and, and weep and worry. Why? Free yourself from the bondage of this world and come into the house of God and be free, allowing Almighty God himself to bless you and your family in this ordinance. We're not playing church here. This is a direct commandment from Almighty God. And, and he continues then in the next verse. Verse 6. Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast of the Lord. When you end it on that seventh day, it's a special Sabbath again. Seven unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. And there shall no leaven bread, leaven to bread, be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. You keep sin out of your house. And you know, it is so easy to let sin in if you're not careful, especially through television if you're not careful. Verse 8, And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is done, because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. This goes on from generation to generation. Father always frees his children from bondage if you will believe. He will give you a new life, a new outlook on life. When you're serving him instead of the ways of the world. This is why you want to know the difference between the night of the Lord and the day of the Lord. God takes care of his own in both the night 
and the day. Verse 9, And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes. What's between your eyes? Your brain. That the Lord's law may be in thy mouth, for with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. In other words, you let your hand take that scroll and open it. They didn't have King James Bibles back then. And this is what Passover was for, was for a time of teaching, for teaching that scroll, the Psalms and others, Psalms 118 and others on Passover. And what he said is, is let it sink into your forehead. In other words, you've got to memorize it and know what is right and what is wrong. Verse 10 Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in his season from year to year, every year. Verse 11, And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he swear unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it thee. 12, That thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix, and every firstling that cometh of a beast which thou hast, the male shall be the Lord's. That they're his. He claims it. Verse 13. And every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb, and if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck, and all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem. In other words, um, an ass is an unclean animal, not fit for sacrifice to the Lord. So what Lord says, if you're going to use that ass as, as a, um, an animal of uh, servitude and commerce, then give me a lamb to take his place in his stead. Don't give him the ass, okay, because it's unclean for sacrifice. Verse 14, And it shall be when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What is this? Why is this? That thou shalt say unto him, By strength of hand the Lord brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. And I say to you even to this day, by strength and by the hand of God, if you believe on him, and if you partake of our present Passover, which is to say the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, then God himself delivers you from the bondage of this world. Verse 15, And it came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go that the Lord slew all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that openeth a matrix being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. And so it is fine to serve God. God needs people that serve him. And this is how they were chosen. And, and, and so it is. And many are going to say, well, now wait. Uh, how, God then wants, well, let, let, me, let me make you aware of something if you're not. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. God himself says, all souls belong to me. He owns everybody. It is only that he wants the first lanes in his service. But all, every last child, belongs to God. All souls are mine. They are his to do with as he chooses, and he's always fair. Verse 16, And it shall be for a token upon thine hand, and for frontlets between thine eyes, 
For by strength of hand the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. You let that settle down into your little old brain, and you absorb it, and you remember it. And don't ever forget it. God does not choose to put his children in bondage. God freed us from bondage for one and all times, if you so choose. Because if you allow yourself to be in bondage in this earth age, then it's by your own choice. It is, well, and many people will say, well, then life is like, will be like a rose garden. No, he didn't promise that. He, he picks can-do type people. There's a few thorns among the rose bushes, friend. But he picks people that, that's just a piece of cake. When you know God is with you, you can cut it. You can handle anything. It, bring it on. Doesn't matter. Why? Because you have the advantage. Because you're free of bondage. You have the blessings of God. And God does bless his children. This is a sign for that. To make you remember, God looks out for his own. Verse 17, And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Let's peradventure. The people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. And give a little hard time here, they may turn around and head right back. See, God knows his people pretty well, too. You've always got a few wimps scattered around in between. And that's why the strong must stand and take care of the wimps. Verse 18. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up hornest out of the land of Egypt. Hornets meaning they were five abreast, in order. I mean marching, coming out by order. Every, God, When God is engineering something, it is always by order. There's nothing, there's no mobs about it. It's always by order. He took them to this Red Sea, and this will be symbolic of the flood of Satan's lies in the end times, we'll get by it just fine. Why? God will see to it. Just as he will the flood of the last days of Satan's little reign. He'll take care of that Red Sea. It's a piece of cake for him, if you believe. 18. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up hornets. We got that. 19. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, as he had promised. For he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones away hence with you. Don't you leave me here. And they didn't. They took those bones of Joseph who had first uh, saved Israel uh, right there uh, in Egypt itself, 20. And they took their journey from Sukkoth, this is the booths, and encamped in Ethan. Ethan means um, uh, bounded by the sea. And there it'll be in the edge of the wilderness. And there they are. They're kind of binding themselves in, and if Pharaoh raises up again, they don't have too much of a place to go. Verse 21, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to give them, to give them shade, where the women and the children and all that multitude could have comfort from that desert heat to lead the, them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. 
God is the God of both the day and the night. God always takes care of his own. Can you imagine that? When he knows that they're probably, they've been in bondage for 400 years, they're on their way out, and they're uh, traveling with unleavened bread, and they're rushed, he gives them this cloud in the daytime, a pillar, to protect them from the hot rays of the sun, and to guide them where he wants them to go. And at night, this pillar of fire, God is that consuming fire to protect them, guide them, lead them. God is so good to his children. And, and you wonder if he's aware of you. When you love him, of course he is. He watches over you. He always watches over his children. One more verse to complete the chapter. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night, from before the people. He helped them. He guided them. Why? Because God loves his children. Again, a lot of people are going to say, well, he sure killed a bunch of the Egyptians. Chapter 7, verse 5, so they would know, rather than worshiping some frog that will end them up in hell, that they can worship him and have eternal life. So what is cruel about that? That is the love of God to a stubborn people to teach truth and to deliver even his own through whom Christ would come, who would be the final and eternal Passover that for us, we today, how precious it is to have that, that ability to come into that house that is protected with that blood of the Lamb on the door, the Christ crucified that protects his own. It's your choice. Don't ever, ever let it slip by. All right, bless your heart. You listen in a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. We have one judge. That's our Holy Father. He'll do all the judging, but you do have the right for spiritual discernment as to who you should listen to, who you should follow, and let it always be the Word of God that you choose. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Now, prayer request, don't need that number, you don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. He knows now. He has time for you. Do you understand Hosea 6.6, 6, I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your love. I want, I want that grace. And that's what he wants from you. That's what the sacrifice will be during the millennium, is love, loving him, our Heavenly Father, for what he does for us. So... With that, let us go to his throne. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. 
touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. We're going to go with um, Terrence from Pennsylvania. A friend of mine who claims to be a believer said to me that we are all gods. He offered up John 10, 34, which says, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? And Psalms 82, 6, which also says, ye are gods. My question is, did he take these scriptures out of context? I believe that he did, and I would like clarification in this matter. I thank you, and may God continue to bless your ministry. Well, he sure does. You know, it, it is just a matter of understanding what God is saying. You know, I, I'm going to borrow from um, a scripture I quoted a moment ago in the lecture, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. All souls are mine. That's ownership. All people belong to God. Not all people are little gods. Do you want me to say that again? Read it the way it's written. All people belong to God. People are not little gods. It's that he owns you. He created you. He brought your very soul into existence. So naturally he owns you. He is your judge. He will judge whether you receive eternal life or you go to hell. That's, that's what it comes to. So I, I don't know. People. Some people like to... Say, well, there it goes. It says right there, God says we're gods. No, it doesn't say that. It says we are gods, meaning ownership. He owns us, lock, stock, and barrel, okay? Maybe not, not all of us have barrels, but anyway, be that as it may, that's the way it goes. Uh, Keith from Alabama. I heard you say many times there will be no tribulation. I have to correct you. I'm afraid you've never heard me say there is no tribulation, for there are two of them. But there is no rapture. Okay. You've heard me say many times there is no rapture. Why? Because Christ is coming here. But uh, please explain the Matthew 24 and uh, verses 21 through 29. Well, it's naturally, you've got the tribulation of Antichrist first where God's elect are delivered up before him. That's the tribulation of the false messiah. But then following that, here comes the tribulation of almighty God. But he's not mad at you. He's angry at those that disbelieve him. So you've got nothing to worry about either way. God protects you um, when you're delivered up. And uh, so there, there's two tribulations. And uh, Mark 13 makes that very, very clear. Uh, Candy from California. Uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number, and his number is 666. How can the same number be for both? Help me understand. I, th I think you're letting it get away from you by confusing the beginning of chapter 13, which breaks away at verse 11. In, in other words, the first beast spoken of from 1 through 11 is a political beast system. But the beast it's talking about here in verse 18, you pick up in the 11th verse. It looks like a lamb. It's got two horns like a lamb. But his voice is the dragon, meaning it's Satan, is the Antichrist. It's a religious beast. It is the same entity, not both. Same. He, he is that religious beast, which is none other than the false prophet and the Antichrist. Okay? And what does 666 mean? Well, it's this, what, what has been taught in the book of Revelation. The sixth seal the sixth trump, and the sixth vial. 
all of those, sin and a Christ appears in them. So all you have to do is read the sixth seal, the sixth trump, and the, and the sixth vial, and you know when Antichrist is getting set up. Marilyn from California, what does the Christian flag look like? Well, you've got one right behind me here. I don't know if we could, we'll zoom in on it maybe here in a minute. Uh, we'll give just a moment. It's, the Christian flag is a flag that in the military, when that flag flies, which as you can see is white with the blue with the red cross on it, it means a Christian service is being held at that time. And that is the Christian flag. We always fly it along with the American flag. Okay, and there you have it right uh, before you. Cheryl from Wisconsin, would you please tell me where in the Bible God refers himself to a fir tree and uh, as... Uh, and, well, it's, it's Hosea chapter 14, verse 8. Hosea 14, 8. This is where he told Hosea to go marry a harlot because Israel was har being a harlot around. And God wanted to reclaim them. And the names of the children, Ami and the Lord Ruhamah, which he would call them Loami, meaning not my people, and Ruama, which means pitied or not loved, is Lo means not. But then in that 14th chapter, he's, they, it is Ami and Ruami, meaning I love my children, and I am as a great fir tree. Why? Because it's evergreen. It doesn't die. It it's always has its leaves, and it's symbolically, uh, symbolic of Almighty God himself. The fragrance of mo many insects are driven away by the odor that the fur and the cedar puts off and, and keeps things clear and clean. And so God would liken himself to that. Uh, and naturally, that tree has com come to symbolize our Father eternal life not our father but eternal life because it's evergreen larry from georgia in my king james version it says in genesis 4 1 and adam knew eve his wife and she conceived and bare cain and said i have gotten a man from the lord now i believe that cain is the son of satan so is my king james version printed wrong not not really it's just that they don't bring out the uh, full truth. Naturally, the conception took place back um, in chapter 3, the first conception. And then Adam did know his wife, and she conceived again. In other words, she was pregnant with twins. Well, how can you possibly say that? Well, verse 2 of chapter 4, after Cain was born, it says, it says in English, and again, but the word in the Hebrew is she continued in labor and gave birth to Abel. In other words, they were twins with separate fathers. Uh, Kenneth from Idaho, my question is about the rapture. It says that when Jesus comes back, we will all meet him in the sky and the dead in Christ shall rise. My question is, the people who were devout Christians and died years ago, shouldn't they be in heaven already without having to be resurrected from the ground? You got it. Bingo. That's where the subject starts in, uh, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. There's where your subject is. If you believe Christ rose from the dead, you better believe that anyone that is dead in him is risen also. That's the subject. There is no way that we who are alive and remain can precede the dead. Why? Because they're already there. Okay. And then at the last trump, we're all changed into spiritual bodies. The word ara, as it is used in the Greek there, is not sky. It's not atmosphere. It's breath of life, meaning your spiritual body. Uh, Will from Pennsylvania. I'm looking in the Bible to find where it says that no man knows the exact time the end will happen. Well, that, that's real easy. You'll find it in Mark chapter 13. 
it gives you the parable of the fig tree, which gives you the season. He says, hey, when you see that shoot set out, both the good and the bad fig, you better know. He, he didn't say, maybe you should learn this. He said, learn it. And he meant it. Because then you know the last generation, which is to say the generation of the fig tree. That was uh, then uh, Jeremiah 24 lets us know what executes that order. And it is when Israel becomes a nation again. That happened in 1948. Both the good and the bad fig being there, as, as uh, Jeremiah 24 so stipulates. Wilton from Alabama. I heard Pastor Murray say that finding the United States in the Bible is what got him started, and I wondered if you would tell us where that scripture is. Well, of course, it is the fact that the house of Judah and the house of Israel are split. That the house of Israel went over the Caucasus Mountains, was taken by the Assyrian 200 years before Judah was taken captive. They migrated over those Caucasus mountains and were later called Caucasians and, and then settled in Europe. And then many migrating later to the Canada and the United States of America. But, but Isaiah chapter 18 lets you know, naturally, the probe that got me was this person said, isn't it wonderful to know where America is mentioned in the Bible? Well, I, I, was, I was a young Marine. And I said, boy, it sure would be. And after he left, I thought, what did he say? Because naturally, what everybody wants to know is what does the Bible mean to me? How, how does it apply to me? Because it applies to everyone. And when you know your place in it, then you feel that closeness to Almighty God. And you know that there's no accidents. God is still on the throne. And he is still in charge. And he still gets it done. Okay. Uh, Tim from Michigan. I've been divorced 10 years. Can I remarry? Scripture is unclear to me if I can. Well, Tim, let me ask you a question. Is divorce the unpardonable sin? Well, nowhere in the Bible does it say divorce is the unpardonable sin. Well, now we've got that put to the side. Then, Christ died on the cross to forgive sins, and he said if somebody sins, even if it's seven times seven, yes, 490 times, and they truly repent, you forgive them. Now, have you repented for any part you might have had in shortcomings for that divorce? Uh, maybe you say you didn't, it wasn't your fault. Well, it doesn't matter, just repent if there should be, should have been. And when God forgives you, as a teacher of God's word, if I did not think and know that you had a clean sheet by your name with all forgiven, then you could go in peace and remarry. I know many people will disagree with me on that, but then a lot of people like to hold people as making second-class citizens out of divorcees and anyone else they can catch shorthanded to make them sit at the back of the church and be second-class citizens. Okay, that's not Christian. That's not what Christ died on the cross for. And if you don't quite frankly forgive, then God's not going to forgive you. So my teaching is that uh, repent, ask God's forgiveness, and go in peace. Uh, Michael from Oklahoma, I have been studying with you now for six years, and I like your program. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I have a question. What chapter and verse in the Bible talks about the health laws? Thank you, and God bless you. Leviticus chapter 11 will give you a pretty good rundown on them. I can give you a shortcut. Don't eat scavengers. Okay. 
um, that's and and you'll be pretty in pretty good shape. God does not intend that we should. He did not create scavengers to be food. Kathy from but Leviticus 11 will break it down for you. Kathy from Missouri. I don't understand. In the first Earth age, we were in spiritual bodies, and Satan fell, and the warfare continued. What kind of warfare was it? Since we were in spiritual bodies, then no one was killed, was killing each other. Well, it was spiritual warfare, but there wasn't that much of it. God put an end to it. Bam. He, um, he ended that first earth age abruptly with the katabo, the overthrow. He was not a little upset. He was a whole bunch upset. This is why he. This is why we have the plates even split, where we have Europe way off over here in Africa and America here, and yet <clears throat> in the middle of America in Nebraska, in Ash Falls State Park, in Nebraska, you got rhino. You oh, you got all African animals, rhinoceroses, and I, I don't mean just scattered a little bone here and there. I mean where the ash came out, they suffocated and died right there. Many of the mothers even having little ones in their rib cage to this day. It's an awesome thing to see five different types of camel and all the um, rhinoceroses, turtles, birds, African birds in the middle of America. Artifacts. Uh, why? Well, it documents God's word is true. The Katabo, the overthrow. That's not Noah's flood. That's when he ended the first earth age. Uh, you with Companion Bibles, Appendix 146 covers that pretty well. Betty from Missouri. In chapter 2, verse 18, Father is Ruel, but in chapter 3, the Father's name is Jethro. Please explain. Now, that's in Exodus, and it was uh, Moses' wife's uh, father. He was a Midianite priest. Ruel is his given name, and it means friend of God. Okay. But Jethro, Jethro is a title that means his excellency. I mean, he was a priest. And it, w it was called Jethro being a title, his excellency being the proper translation. But his name, a given name, would be Ruel, friend of God. Elizabeth from Tennessee, would you explain what the rapture is? Well, it doesn't exist because it's not in the Word of God. A lot of people try to put it in there in 1 Thessalonians 4, but that's not the subject. The subject is if you believe Christ died and rose, then everyone else that is dead in him is with him. They've already gone. They're not out here in some hole in the ground. Only their flesh bodies went back to dirt. But they are very vivacious, alive, and with the Father in paradise. Ted from Oklahoma. What is the acacia tree, and how much is a hen of olive oil? A hen of olive oil, can, it's according to whose measures Josephus would say, Oh, let me think. Um, say seven eighths of a gallon. Okay, almost a full gallon. And otherwise, the the another measure for a hen would be about a gallon and almost a half. So it's kind of like a lot of figures over time. It's according to whose hen um, you're measuring by. The sesa tree is a cinnamon tree. It's, it's many trees that cinnamon comes from, that uh, quesa comes from. Sarah from Florida. Pastor Marie said that in the Revelation 9, the word locust was translated Arab. I can't find that in my Strong's Concordance. Well, if you were listening closely, I said in the Hebrew tongue. So you need to go to Joel. We'll go to the book of Joel and the Minor Prophets, where it's speaking of the same locust. Pick up the word Arabi in the Hebrew tongue, and then go to the word, listen to me carefully, not Arab, 
but Arabian. Arabian in the Hebrew tongue. And basically you've got the same word, okay? That's when, when, you, when it states in the message I just gave, Kings of the East, when you go Kedem, which means go to the Euphrates, look east and look what's in front of you. Open your eyes and look what's in front of you from, from the Euphrates. What do you see? Turkey, Syria, Afghanistan, mainly Iran, Afghanistan and Pakistan. So that's the kings of the east and they're going to swarm. Well, have you listened to the news lately? A lot of swarming going on. Okay. James from South Carolina, please define sowing of seed. Well, naturally, um, biblically speaking, what is the seed? The seed is the word of God. And the way you sow the word of God is you broadcast it. And, and it utilizes in the, uh, let's say in um, Matthew chapter 13, the art of broadcasting, which is where a man takes a bag of seed, and you can cover about 30 feet if you have arms like mine, in, in sowing and broadcasting seed. Well, that's the way you broadcast the word of God. And I have to stop broadcasting right now because I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, but most of all, God loves you for it. Hey, it makes his day. When you take the letter he's written you and cover it with understanding how he loves you for that. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always, I do mean always, bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me, listen good. Now, you stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Book of Peter. Here we have two books, First and Second Peter that are absolutely fascinating. That great old fisherman telling us, leading us, directing us, guiding us, going into the depth, if you would, in that second book, into the three earth ages, giving the most accurate recorded account of the events that transpire and document that there are three earth ages, that there was one before this one, this one, and one to come. Peter, the great fisherman which in his gentleness and his kindness brings us uh, two books, the books of Peter, that lead, guide, direct, even in your daily life, that teach and show you how to be happy, how to find that peace of mind, and to know yourself. The books of Peter, I know you're going to enjoy them.
Mother and father. You know, our father, he arranged a great union when he brought forth Adam and Eve and all couples of the world. And knowing that man and woman needed each other as helpmates to live in this life, to stand beside each other, to be with each other. And you know, uh, the honoring a mother and a father, we have some people that, we, you may have had a parent that was kind of honorary. Well, always remember what you're honoring them for is you're here. They brought you into the world. And the rest, sometimes we just have to put to the side, but do honor that you're a child of God and you're here. And you know, the fifth commandment, honor your mother and your father, is the first commandment that has 